All right, so a topic that I promised to get to, but for whatever reason I've managed to put off. Figured I'd go ahead and take a good shot at it today. And I say good shot at it because the topic is injury prevention. And if you've watched my prior videos, you know I'm not terribly good at injury prevention myself. So who knows, maybe one day I'll watch this video and learn something. But the particular injury I'm gonna be talking about today is something that happens commonly to practitioners of swordsmanship, especially Japanese style swordsmanship, to the point where it's often referred to as sword elbow. And injury wise, it is a form of tendonitis that could be similar to tennis elbow. It tends to hit most people top to top outside of the forearm, basically in here is where they tend to feel it and it can be quite debilitating. However, there are other well, parts of your arm that can also be sometimes even catastrophically damaged. At the very least, it can really put a damper on your training. At worst, yeah, you could be looking at something very serious. So how does it tend to happen? And in my experience, what are some ways to try to prevent it? Again, before I get started, caveats. I don't consider myself any kind of master expert, anything like that. This is, this is, again, just my decades of experience, and yes, I've, I've done this to myself many, many, many times. But the second caveat, I never intend to contradict anything that you are being taught, learning, practicing, and your teacher, instructor, may actually have much better advice than I do. So if, if you've got some of that, let's get that conversation going as usual in the comments. Let's, let's share our different methods for, well, not only preventing, but possibly even treating this particular injury. So let's start by talking about how it tends to happen and why it's so common in Japanese style swordsmanship. It tends to happen when you get to a point in your practice where you start to do drills, training sessions of multiple, multiple cuts in a row. And we're talking 100 cuts, 300 cuts, 500 cuts, 1000 cuts, where you might be going for speed or power or both. And it tends to happen most in the cuts where you are working against gravity, not in the cut, but in the stopping of the cut. So downward or downward-ish. Now I've mentioned in other videos that I use the angles of a clock for my cutting angles. So I'm thinking about that 12 o'clock vertical, right? That's pretty common. Or the kesagiris, which for me are one o'clock and 11. And the idea is you start with your blade up in an upper position or something like that, and you cut, well, quickly and or powerfully down and stop suddenly, right? Now, there are many different aspects of just how this is done that can make this more or less dangerous, and we'll get to that. And again, I never want to contradict anything that you are being taught. So your instructor may already be giving you great advice on how to avoid tearing something. But what's happening in that sudden stop is it's putting a lot of strain on your arms, potentially. And that puts a lot of strain not only on the muscles, so you can tear muscles, but worse, you could, you could tear the tendons. And they take a lot longer to heal, so it tends to hurt more. And usually it's up here. Now, it also could be tendons in your hand or wrist. Yeah, that's something that could also potentially happen. So yeah, that, that could be even harder to heal from. So my first piece of advice on how to avoid this sounds simple, but in my experience, it's actually the hardest thing for most people to do. And that's take it easy. I'm, I'm terrible at it myself. And part of it is, again, I never want to contradict anything that your instructor is trying to get you to do, but sometimes your instructor puts an expectation on students or a class that's based on, well, not only what he's comfortable with, but also what most of the other people in the class are comfortable with, and that might not be you. Either they've got more conditioning, or people are just built different. And sometimes, I certainly am a great case of this, that my connective tissue is not nearly as strong as the average person, so I will get injured well before my average fellow student will. This also comes up a lot depending on a particular way an instructor 
is insisting you do something because it's traditionally the way it's done. I understand that part, but everybody's body's a little bit different. Sometimes your body just doesn't move well that way, or maybe it doesn't move that way at all. And this is not just about swordsmanship, but I have been injured many, 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 many times in martial arts classes because I'm learning a new technique or, or practicing a new variation of a technique and the instructor is like, no, don't do it that way, do it this way. And I'm trying to tell him, okay, my body doesn't move that way. It's like, no, do it this way. Snap. And then I'm out of commission. Sometimes with an injury, I don't fully come back from. Yeah, sometimes your body just isn't going to do it that way. So if I'm going to continue in that art, you know, get back on the proverbial, proverbial horse, I can talk today, I'm going to have to figure out how to do it differently. And there are other arts that do it in different ways. Other instructors that teach it different ways. So yeah, there's a whole universe out there of choices and possibilities. If the art's hurting you, okay, you might want to take a different path. It's kind of like that old joke. You go to the doctor and say, it hurts when I do this. And the doctor says, well, don't do that. Okay, my doctor tells me that all the time. And I pretty much never listen because there's stuff I want to do. <laughs> And sometimes it's, it's, a lot of it is sometimes ego. You want to keep up with your fellow classmates and be able to perform and feel confident and competent and stuff like that. So, you know, your instructor might actually be telling you, take it easy, take it slow, don't do as many as the other people, know when to take a break, rest, tap out, whatever it is. And you just, you can't do it for one reason or another. It's, it's the hardest thing to ask sometimes is the simplest thing. Is just take it easy, take a break, take care of yourself. Now, me, as I mentioned before, when it comes to tendon injuries, I don't tend to get a lot of warning before something tears as compared to injuries to muscles and things like that. So, yeah, sometimes I'm trying something and I get hurt before I know what's going on. So I actually have to be proactively careful. And again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not very good at it. But taking it easy. No pain, no gain. Well, if you're bodybuilding, if you're building up muscle tissue and you're doing it safely, yeah, that's a saying, but there's a, there's a level, a degree, when that is absolutely not true. If you injure yourself, then you can't practice, you can't train, and therefore you're not gaining, you're losing. Another variation I heard of that is, pain is the sensation of weakness leaving your body. Yeah, until you cripple yourself. <laughs> it's, yeah. Some people can you know, push through that stuff and, and not suffer catastrophic injury. Especially, you know, either you're prone to it or the other thing, talking about getting older and your body just can't do the things well that it used to do. This is also really critical if you used to practice something a lot and you were really good at it and really fit and then you walked away from it, from it for a while and you're trying to get back into it. Again, another old saying, your brain's writing a check that your body can't cash. You know, your, your wiring remembers how to do this. But then when your body tries to do it, snap. Um, yeah. That was dumb, but very understandably dumb. So my best and first advice, take it easy, take it slow, listen to your body, shelve your ego. Next piece of advice, alter your technique. Now, again, I don't, tend to, I don't want to contradict anything that you're being taught, but sometimes you might need to tweak something a little bit. You may be very lucky and have a teacher who's quite aware of the potential for this and knows how to avoid it and is going to teach you techniques based on that. Or, you know, just like taking it easy, don't be afraid to communicate with your instructor and let them know how you're doing, that, you know, things are hurting. Shell that ego. Sometimes, again, it's a simple thing to ask, but it can be a hard thing to do, especially if you're trying to keep up with your fellow students or whatever. But a couple of things I've learned how to do, or let me, let me reverse engineer it. A couple of ways I've learned how to hurt myself. Let's start with that. I found that the injuries tend to happen most commonly when I stop the sword higher. I talked about my cutting stroke lengths, but depending on the art you're studying or the kata in that art or whatever, there are some that do stop their downward cuts, well, sometimes quite high. 
And the reason for that is, well, they're practicing. This happens in Kendo too, where you're looking for a really quick shortcut that's really just designed to crack the person on the head or the wrist or something like that. So a long cut doesn't serve you in that art and you're going for a lot of speed and power and quickness. And yeah, even somebody working with a Shinai, and we'll talk about weapons choice in the next section, they can suffer this and often do. It's pretty common in Kendo. So stopping at high. Now, for some of us who have practiced sword arts, working with Boken and things where we're working with a partner doing two-person kata, and we are intentionally stopping the cut before it, it cracks them in the head or the clavicle or the arm or whatever, yeah, we may be practicing a cut that looks fast and or powerful, but we're stopping it high. And pragmatically, I've covered this before, there are reasons why you might want to do this in an actual fencing situation. But if you're going for speed and power in this, as if you're doing a long cut, yeah, that's often where your arms bear the brunt of the dead stop, okay? For those of you that practice, on the other hand, Tama Shigiri and are used to not only cutting through a target, but drawing the sword through the target, think about the body mechanics that you use with that. The more full body action and the longer the cut, this is what will keep you safer. Again, this may be against what you're being taught, so just something to be aware of, and you can discuss it with your instructor if you feel comfortable doing that. But for me, if I can do two things. One, if I'm putting more power into it, just let the sword go further down to say a gadan position with more, a little bit more draw in it than straight cut, which is good form. Again, different forms of Japanese swordsmanship have different dynamics for their cut. That one, You'll also notice the other thing that's happening, which is the next thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna point out, is the more of your body you can get into the cut. So it's not just your arms. If you're really focused on keeping a very upright posture, sometimes, yeah, your arms wind up again bearing all of the strain. But if you're practicing an art that does tamashigiri, you usually do naturally put at least shoulder, if not waist, and sometimes hip and even well maneuvering. You step in, slide in, rock in with the cut. The more of that you can do, it's basically like any other form of absorbing recoil, the more of your body that's involved. Same thing with, with taking a fall. If you're practicing break falling, tumbling, ukemi, something like that, you know, you learn how to absorb it with your entire body. It's, it's pretty much the same concept. The more you can let yourself use your entire body, so you're taking some of it on the shoulders, the back, the hips, the legs, and you can do you can do that kind of short, but yeah, I immediately start to feel it more in my arms if I'm stopping shorter because I just don't have as much body behind it. So, again, this is a great conversation for the comments. In the system that you're studying, are there any mechanics like that that are discussed to prevent tendonitis, especially if your practice is repetitive cutting? Okay, so my third big piece of advice might be expensive, but considering the cost of medical care, at least in my country, and then you've got to consider, well, potential of lost productivity or just straight up quality of life if you can't use your arms for a while. <sighs> yeah, those are considerations um, that might affect your investment. But there's, there's also places I recognize with, you know, import restrictions and things and how many swords you can own. Yeah, you might not be able to do what I'm about to recommend, which is consider maybe a different sword. Now, I've already mentioned that this is a common injury with Chinai which are notoriously light, and I've certainly seen it happen, and it's happened to me, with Boken, which tend to be lighter than a lot of swords, not necessarily, but we've got to consider weight, point of balance, sometimes where that Boken and Shinai injury happens, and also potentially length of grip. So how does that play into it? I certainly have quite a collection of swords and I kind of treat them like a set of golf clubs in certain ways in terms of certain swords for me are for certain, well, training routines. You'll notice I'm not wearing my brace. And so far what I'm doing has been, well, pretty 
pretty safe so far. I've been working slowly and carefully over the last year and a half and I can do what I'm demonstrating today without risking, well, what would be a very common injury or exacerbating my existing injury by doing cutting like this if I'm not careful. I'm also restricting this to a lighter blade. So for me, I've learned that heavier blades are good for, you know, if I'm working on strength training, power training, or sometimes just working on good form, something where I can work a little bit slower with less repetition, and I'm not worried about that quick cut and stop so much, okay? If I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna tend to pick something lighter, and for me, my sweet spot is about two pounds, three ounces. But you've also gotta consider point of balance. If it's too far forward, yeah, the leverage is working against you, makes the sword feel heavier, harder to stop, therefore more strain on the things that are likely to get injured doing this, especially since you're working against gravity. So point of balance a little bit closer to the guard. My sweet spot is about three and a half, three and a quarter inches. That's a sword I can use for frequent, repetitive, quick cutting practice and usually not have many problems. But even I had to spend the last year and a half getting used to that again so I can do it without a brace. So yeah, don't, don't let your mind write a check that your body can't cash. Know when to dial it back and take care of yourself. And again, sometimes you don't have much choice about what sword you're working with. My original Shingunto, yeah, that's a three and a half pound sword. So more than a pound heavier than what I found is comfortable for me. I worked for, with that sword for a long time. Yeah, I, I had to be really careful about, well, how far I took it. So that's one thing to consider, weight and balance of the weapon might just be you have a sword that's too heavy for you right now don't get rid of it necessarily and you can use it for other things but for this particular kind of drill and exercise you might want something a little bit lighter the other thing to consider and your mileage may vary on this but shape and texture and wrap of the grip if it's making it harder for you to hang on to the blade based on your hand how your hands built the kind of grip you use you know for instance that ringing of the key cloth where you, you you torque your wrists inward definitely helps give you good control at the end of a cut and stabilize that stop it might also then help you prevent this particular kind of injury it might also exacerbate it depending on what you might have already damaged again listen to your body but sometimes your grip's not letting you do that. Well, the grip of the sword <laughs> is not letting you do that very well. So that's something you're, you're also gonna have to figure out. You know, what kind of grip, shape, girth fits your hand. And then we gotta talk about length. Now, for me, I'm a short guy with short arms and I find that longer sukas just kind of get in my way. But I do have some swords with some somewhat longer sukas up to 15 inches long. And I definitely notice that if my hands are further apart, that they're two individual jobs, shall we say, I feel them happening very separately. Now this can definitely give me a great sense of the leverage that's involved in the technique. Kind of like doing any other kind of martial arts technique, larger in the form it gives you sometimes a clearer sense of the body mechanics behind it. So that can be a really useful tool but sometimes that separation, that you may be reaching even further with the sword and it might change your leverage. It may, it may be something that hurts you or it may be the opposite. Maybe a longer handle helps you prevent your particular risk of injury. That's okay? gonna be something you're gonna have to figure out. Now, I've certainly worked with a lot of power cutters who not only go with the shorter handle, but they actually put their, put their hands really close together. For me, the closer together my hands are, the more they tend to work as a unit and therefore support each other. So for me, shorter grip actually helps me kind of prevent this. But again, your results may vary. You may not have a choice or much choice on the sword, maybe, maybe you've got a blade that you really like, but you know, maybe you could fit a different handle on it. Change the mechanics of that. Several different things you can do with your equipment. But, getting back to my first piece of advice, know when to dial it back. Take it easy, take care of yourself. All right. So, that was not very complete advice. 
as we get our conversation going in the comments, hopefully you guys can definitely add to this and that will then inspire more and well, probably better videos in the future. So keep that stuff coming. I love our conversations. Otherwise, I hope this was useful, helpful. And as always, thanks for watching, following, subscribing. And I do hope to see you back for more. All right, quick bonus. What to do if you're already hurt? Well, treat it like any other muscle or tendon injury. Take it easy, be gentle. If it hurts, don't do it. You can also use heat, ice, things like that. But you're going to find it's probably going to get in the way of you doing a lot of things. Step two, as soon as you can, if you can, seek proper medical attention. It may be worse than you think it is, but your doctor can certainly help you with medications, treatments, braces, or referrals to specialists. Now, my own personal physician, he, I was using those sleeve braces, those things that kind of look like a spandex sleeve. He was no fan of those, and he strongly recommended I use one of these narrow elbow bands for the, that forearm elbow tendonitis, especially one that has a pressure pad in it so you can sink it into the injured area. That helped me a lot, but again, get your own medical advice. If it's damage to the wrist or the hand, yeah, that could potentially be much, much worse. And you could wind up in one of these for well, a lot longer than one of these. But the only way to know for sure is to get medical attention. So if you can do that, do it. Don't take it for granted. Like I said, it could be worse than you think it is. Take care of yourself.